Okay. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, this message, some, some uh, might have heard something along the lines of this before, but I'm going to remind you like what Peter said, that uh, you know, it's good to be reminded of the same stuff over and over again, right? But there might be some new information that you might get out of this today. I know that every time I am ready to teach, I start out with what I think I'm going to do about this big, and it becomes this big. So, you know, it's, and I'm writing a lot of books right now, and that's kind of what these turn out to be. Um, message is called Leadership Through Servanthood, okay? And honestly, uh, growing up, I'm 55 now, and growing up in the 80s and such in the 90s, I've watched a decline over a period of time where we have wound up throughout the world, really, in with leadership gaps. But we really don't have proper leadership, and then a lot of the leaders that get into power, especially in governments, are very corrupt. So, you know, it's a bad thing when you have a leader in your, uh, running your country that is just basically a corrupt individual that, you know, everybody suffers that from that. When you have a servant of the God that we serve that is in a leadership position, whether it's in government, whether it's in uh, a business, uh, especially things like our school system where I work, or a congregation like this, thank you, Patrick, it's important that it be a godly person. It really is. Um, because, you know, the Scripture says that for those that uh, are under a terrible leader, they suffer, and sometimes God allows that to help teach the people, to help kind of wake them up. I'm hoping that's not what happens in our country, but it could be the case. It could be we need to have a lot of people wake up. All right. Now, where does our leadership start? Uh, believe it or not, it starts before you're born. Uh, Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6, and I'm going to read it from up there because it's TLV. So now says Adonai, who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Think about that. If you're going to be a servant of the Most High, he had that idea before you were born. And that's powerful when you think about it, you know. To bring Jacob back to him. Isn't that our, one of our staple missions here is to reach the Jewish people? To gather Israel back to him, for I am honored in the eyes of Adonai, and my God has become my strength. Next. So he says, it is, too, is it, it is too trifling a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. So I will give you as a light for the nations that you should be my salvation to the end of the earth. That's a powerful statement right there. Who's that talking about? It's talking about any of us. Any of us who belong to Adonai, that's talking about us. So if you think about it, in God's master plan, where he knows everything from the beginning to the end, he already knew ahead of time and planned it before you were even born. But that's where it starts, all right? So with the leadership gap that we have, it's worldwide, okay? It has been for decades. And then, you know, of course, the leaders that we have can tend to be serving themselves and not others. Um, let me look at or give it to you uh, from the political uh, view, uh, politicians, okay? Cause, and this is true in anything. It could be business. It could be, I've seen it in congregations and things like that. But the human nature path is first because it's when people think about themselves all the time and they're always worried about doing what they can for themselves, they're going to want the means to take, to get what they want. So that, where does that start off? Well, that becomes exactly what Adonai said not to do is let the love of money be a corrupt thing for you. So they follow after money. Okay, then you see these politicians, especially are my biggest example, that they gain massive amounts of money. But what do they want after that? Power to what? Control. Which if you, any, this is the definition of spiritual witchcraft. Any spirit that wants to control another spirit of any kind. That's what idol worship is. They think that they're controlling this spirit, this demon, really. And they give to them to get something back, but usually it's just control and manipulation, and that is the definition of witchcraft, okay? Because it's idol worship. And this is not a, a path I'm going to go down to teach on right now, but just let me quickly say that 
The word idol means nothing. And when people worship an idol, they're actually worshiping themselves because they're trying to get something out of that idol. So the idol they worship is actually self. Kind of a big... Anyway. Okay, so when you look at the, the leaders that we have or have had for decades in... And I've looked at it from a standpoint, especially a business, okay? Because, you know, I'm, I, uh, I also am a business person. I have my own business. And so, and I've had employees before, and so I always have to look at it from that standpoint, from a government standpoint, running an entire nation, from uh, uh, gov- uh, the uh, local type things that I've seen. You know, I used to live in Cape Coral. And, man, I'm so thankful to live up here as compared to Cape Coral because it's very controlled and corrupt down there. And uh, the government, you know. And so these leaders are basically just trying to get what they want for themselves and control others, okay? But yet, what is leadership? Leadership is a position of responsibility for others, isn't it? It's not a position of power. It's a position of responsibility. And it doesn't matter what that position could be, and it could be, you know, you take it to any level, uh, position of being a husband in a home, position, position of being a congregational leader, position of government. It's still a position of responsibility because we have to give an account of how we deal with other people when this life's over, right? And obviously, we have our sphere of influence and people that we actually do influence and people are responsible for, but... We don't live in a vacuum. Everything we do affects somebody somewhere, and even the trifleest thing that you do could affect somebody worldwide. You don't know. You know, we're on the Internet worldwide. So we, even though we're here in this building here in Bradenton, Florida, we are affecting the entire world to a certain extent for anybody that could possibly catch us on the Internet, even if it's by accident. So our leadership here is vital that is led by God's ways and by his spirit. So it's a position of responsibility that we will give an account for. And uh, I've got a note in here that we gain our inheritance, and I'll have to come back to this, but we gain our inheritance through all the works that we do towards the ends of salvation. And another scripture, I'm not going to go to it, but another scripture tells us what our inheritance is. And this might surprise a few of you, but our inheritance is the lost. The lost are our inheritance. When they come into the kingdom, that's our inheritance. And if you think about it, uh, I've only, I haven't had as many opportunities to actually bring people you know, through the prayer into the kingdom. I've planted a lot of seeds all over the place. I've done a lot of the work. But when, when you actually see somebody come into the kingdom and you know you had a part of it, there's something in you that goes, just got some of my inheritance. You know, and, and that's how you get crowns that you can throw like a Frisbee at Messiah's feet. Okay. So the heart of a leader has to be the heart of a servant. Okay. And I have seen both extremes. I have seen those who are in leadership as being basically dictators and very abusive to other people, both in, I mean, in every respect, in business, in congregations around. uh, I've been around. You know, I've helped a lot of different congregations, both in Oklahoma and here, in various different roles, the associate pastor, music leader, all that kind of stuff. And I've seen... The best of the best and the worst of the worst, okay? And you can get either way, but it boils down to, do you have the heart of a servant? I'm going to give you this side note right now because we think of, you know, you got people down here that are just uh, in the congregation, things like that. Let's look at it from the congregation standpoint. And then you have these leaders up here, okay? Well, here's the way you need to look at it because we're all down here. But the lost are out there. So that means any citizen of the kingdom of God is a leader. Any citizen. Now, those, there are those of us who take on roles that are a little bit higher. I guess you'd say higher, really just more responsibility. In other words, things that need to get done, we just get done. It's like up here teaching, as an example. 
That doesn't make us any different than anybody in the congregation, okay? We're all the same. We're all leaders. Every single human being sitting in this room right now is a leader because you're in the kingdom. Israel is supposed to be the brightest light and the best leaders to the entire world. Okay, but let me define Israel for you. Anybody who serves God, believes in God, trusts the Messiah, struggles with man, struggles with God, that's Israel. Okay? So if you came into the kingdom through Messiah, you are Israel. There are some of us that have Jewish blood in us and some of us that don't. You're still Israel. Okay, remember that. Okay. The most vital component to being able to lead at all, to be able to really have relationships at all, is compassion. We saw that in Messiah over and over and over again. I'm always going to refer back to Messiah as my example. He is my barometer. I look in, into the scripture and I see what he did. I see how he acted. I see the way it was played out. Every move he made was based on compassion. Okay? And it's just the vital component. I don't care if you're a politician, you're in the military, you're in business, or you're in ministry. You have to have compassion. I mean, probably the hardest thing you can think of is somebody who's a, a like, say, a general. I remember uh, watching an interview with, uh, after the Iraqi war with that general. I can't remember his name, but he was, like, in tears over having to, you know, take out people. Because, Schwartz, yeah, he was, he's a man of compassion. You know, so leadership has to have the heart of a servant that is filled with compassion for other human beings. That's the hard part. Them human creatures, they're hard to deal with, right? Okay. So basically, you can have leaders that, <coughs> excuse me, they're not necessarily bad leaders, but they can get too focused and caught up in everything they're doing. Let's face it, when people take on responsibilities, it gets busy. I mean, for me right now, I've got two weeks off from the school system, and I'm busier than I was when I was working. And, you know, so we can get caught up in everything we're doing. And that's why leaders in the congregation, especially, such as rabbi, I mean, I can look at you, uh, Rabison, and tell, and tell you, you and rabbi need to schedule enough time off throughout the year, period, because you've got to get fresh, because there's so much that we deal with. Because the responsibility never gets less. All the stuff that comes at us usually doesn't decline. It usually increases. Now, it's better when you have more people that can be in leadership and take on more responsibility. And anybody who wants to become more in leadership needs to seek out somebody who's willing to apprentice them. Does that make sense? And those who are in leadership need to be willing to have those they mentor. That's what hopefully Friday nights are going to become. I've discussed this with Rabbi a lot. Uh, we're going to be doing that uh, uh, conference, I guess you'd call it, or whatever. It's just a bunch of teaching about worship. He calls it theology of worship. I call it the reality of worship. And it is the theology, but it takes you from the theology to the reality of it. But the idea at the end of all this is that we will get people in here that from any walk, any, you know, from Christian church, whatever, or Messianic, that want to be mentored in music, singing, you know, instruments, sound, video, okay, all of it for the sake of worship, and that we would actually start doing some. Uh, services that would be strictly prayer and praise and allow them to use their talents to develop. That's something I did back in Oklahoma is I would develop worship leaders, uh, help them how to figure out how to pick their song list and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have somebody to mentor and you feel like you have something to offer, it could be the most basic thing like learn how to run the kitchen. Okay? Find somebody who's willing to do it, you know, and teach them. Because eventually, all us old folks, like me, 
ain't going to be around anymore to teach anybody anything. So our youth are our future. We have to start teaching them everything they're willing to learn. And, you know, when it comes to different things in leadership, it's vital. I mean, how many more rabbis are we going to produce? Think about it. We're all of us old folks going to die off, and then we ain't got no teachers left. I mean, we have to think of the future, and we have to think of our people. We have to think of how can we grow the kingdom and bring more leaders into it, because every citizen, I'm going to say this again and again, every citizen in the kingdom of God is a leader, okay, to a certain extent, whether you're just leading somebody to the lost, whether you're just helping somebody and it helps, or whatever, you're still a leader, because the secular world does not really care about leading anybody or helping anybody, all right, so... So, mentoring should be something that is always at the back of mind of anybody who has the talent and the responsibility to be able to use their talents for God in the kingdom and leadership. So, now where does it start? It starts in the womb. But where does it start before you, from a standpoint of before you get like where I'm up here, okay? It starts at the home. Okay, and the heaviest responsibility is on the father, the husband, the head of the household. Okay, for those of you who are single, you'll you'll get there someday. But the father is in the unit has the heavy responsibility and doesn't necessarily get a lot of appreciation or respect, but has the most rewarding. When uh, perspective on leadership, when he can see the success of his family members, wife and children and such. Um, Rabbi Judah and Rabbi Isaac have a lot to be proud of. I mean, their family is full-time ministry. If you think about it, the whole family. Uh, that's success to me. You know, that's doing it right. Okay. And for any leader to lead in the kingdom, the home is good training ground. When I say train, basic training. Uh, does anybody not agree with that? <laughs> okay, I think that the, the home can give you a good basic training ground for how to handle other humans, especially when they're so close to you and love you, including your pets like mine. Uh, the most joy and pain can happen in trying to keep a marriage intact and trying to raise children in the righteousness of the kingdom and in the way that we are told to raise them. Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, please. Okay, now I'm going to go through these things, and I've got all of these scriptures together, but there's only certain things I wanted to highlight out of this because it's vital to, to really suck this out. Okay, so children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Leadership starts when you're a child. I mean, I was a rebellious rock star. I did not treat my parents right, so I re that's where it starts. You have to start learning how to be a leader by being a proper child. Okay? Because children tend to grow up and become adults. They have to obviously see the example in front of them, right? Not do as I say, not as I do type stuff. That doesn't work. All right? Next one. Sorry. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. Go ahead. So it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, that's the... the Amazing that that actually comes with a reward on it. So there's not that many that come with a reward like that. And that's kind of cool to be able to, you know, live longer life on the earth just for honoring your parents. Okay? All right. Next. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that can sometimes go the wrong way. You know, when it says don't provoke your children to anger... That is learning how to raise them and discipline them where it doesn't bring anger. I have seen so much anger in children in today's society, especially with the things I do. You know, I deal with kids with uh, emotional and uh, behavioral issues. All I see in them is anger. You know, because all of us want a good home, all of us want a good life, and when you don't have that growing up as a kid, sometimes it can really tick you off. Okay. Next. 
slaves, or let's take sometimes and switch that out to say employees, okay? Obey your human masters with respect and reverence, with sincerity of heart as you would the Messiah. Okay, stop just a second, Joan. Now, you're going to see repetitively a lot of this kind of stuff. Anybody who has a servant's heart, not a slave's heart, but a servant's heart, is going to obey their human masters with respect and reverence. Okay. Um, Let me take a little bunny trail for you real quick, because this is kind of disheartening for me. Um, But I am living the experience, my own self, where, and I'll come back to this when I talk about the next thing soon. Um, the room that I'm in, we have a teacher and then two of us paraprofessionals, and we work together as a team. Uh, if the teacher needs to leave the room, I take over, or the other paraprofessional takes over. We all do everything together. We don't, you can't even tell who the teacher is when you walk in the door, and that's the way they want it. Next door, have a wonderful young lady who's the teacher over there. And then she has two, like us, two paras that help. And it's like a fight going on, constant, of who wants to be in control. Okay, that is not serving and obeying your human master with respect and reverence. But the difference is, because this uh, teacher next door, they removed one para and brought in gal named Allison, who I know through John Skorsky's ministries. John Skorsky uh, will be in here doing worship with us in the future a little bit. He um, runs the, the front just down the street. And um, he, uh, he, one of his ladies that does worship with him is working in the next room. So I got another believer next to us. And I see the difference. It's huge. Because she obeys the human master with reverence and respect because it's as you would the Messiah. It's as if you're working for the Messiah. Now, the Messiah isn't just the Messiah. He's a king. He is the king. And if you ever researched or studied the protocol of how you behave around a king, it, is, it isn't even the same as being around a president or a dictator or anything like that. Yeah, king there is, it is absolute, okay? And you better show respect, you know? And so you take a look at, yeah, it's asked to the Messiah, well, it's, it's asked to the king, okay? And we are citizens in a kingdom with a king, okay? Go on next. Not just under your master's eye as people pleasers, but as slaves of Messiah doing God's will from the soul. That's interesting, yeah, this TLV version has got some interesting stuff to it. Um, from the soul. That's, that's even deeper than just saying from the heart. Um, but people pleasers. There are people who could serve and do something for somebody, but they just want to make people happy. People can tell the difference when they see that you're doing it because you serve God and you want to please him first. They may not know that's what's going on, but eventually it becomes, usually becomes very, you know, um, evident, okay? So in Ephesians, okay. Okay, go to the next one. Serve with a positive attitude as the Lord and not to men. That's not easy to do sometimes, and boy, do I work around people who grumble and grumble. It's like, you know, try to keep the positive attitude. It's not easy. I mean, especially, you know, the pressures that are on a lot of people now because the COVID thing makes going to work not so much a pleasure anymore. I know for me it kind of sucks because it's like I do not want to wear a mask. But, you know, there's more stress. The kids are under more stress because of the mask and such. But we still have to, as long as you keep a positive attitude, a positive attitude is very contagious. It can be, and it can make somebody's day different. Next. Is that the next one? Okay. Knowing that whatever good each one does, that he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. The Lord does not, I mean, the Lord notices everything you do. Okay. And you will get rewards, good or bad. All right, next. Okay, and then masters or employers. 
treat your servants or employees in the same way. Stop using threats knowing that the master of them and any of you too is in heaven and there is no favoritism with them. And that must be a footnote that put on the armor of God. I'm not sure with that. That's part of the TLV, I think. Um, I have known pastors in churches, especially, who were some of the most abusive people I've ever seen in my life. Okay? <clears throat> Typically, a lot of the work that gets done is volunteer. Don't pay a lot of people in ministries because it's not there. The money's just not there. But yet, you're giving back to God. Okay? Even in that, okay? There have been times when I've had to work under any, you know, jobs, things like that, where I just had to just keep going and doing what I need to do because I know that Messiah is my king and eventually it would not last forever. But man, was I abused. In fact, the last, uh, I'm not going to go there, but I mean, somebody I have had to work under a couple of years ago, wow, uh, just. I didn't even realize I was getting abused because I'm just, you know, I walk in happy because I've got God on my side and I'm happy and everything. And then people are telling me later on next year, it's like, how did you make it through that? And it's like, what? <laughs> you know, so it happens. But with a servant's heart, you can get through anything, can't you? You know, because we're working. Now, if there's anybody not working, you don't have a servant's heart. Because there's too much work to be done to sit around doing nothing. Okay, that's a side note. All right, next. Oh, that's one through nine, right? We're on to Hebrews. Okay. Let me just go back real quick. Go, Just stay there for a minute. There is something to look at in what everything I just read that I want to highlight one last thing before, or once again before I move on is that everything is as unto the Messiah. Okay, as unto the Lord, however it's written in your translation, okay? All right. Okay, so we're talking about the family unit right now, and we're talking about a servant's heart, okay? So in the family unit, and I'm kind of harping on the father because he is the anchor, okay? In the family unit, the father is the anchor of the entire unit. When the anchor is not present, the ship just floats along in any direction the winds would take it. This includes with the wife and the children both. The spouse is the responsibility of the head of the household as much as the children. And at our time of judgment, the spiritual head of the household will give an account of their stewardship of both the, all the people under their care. And that could be, spiritually speaking, you know, head of a ministry, or it could be the family, the father and the family. And in the same manner, you know, the congregation is the fruit of the, con of the leader of that congregation. Okay? And... With that being the case, the, these, that fruit is their responsibility, okay? Now, say the leader is no longer here. Does the fruit continue on? Does the fruit continue to bear more fruit because there's seed in the fruit? Well, let's hope so, and let's hope it's good fruit, right? But as the leader of a congregation is at the head and still working, that person sees the fruit of their labors in the people. Okay, so that's a huge responsibility. And I have seen, in fact, recently, unfortunately, where the leader didn't necessarily work with a servant's heart. And I hate to say it, but when you start whacking the sheep, they're going to leave you know, you know, uh, when you start really just abusing the people, they will go find someplace else to be. Okay. Now, for me personally, it's like I don't feel like I could ever leave a congregation without God saying I need to leave, and I would probably argue with Him to begin with. But it has happened a lot for me where I've supposed to go somewhere I didn't want to go, and then God made it happen where I had to leave. I've helped start a lot of, of ministries. Um. But when you look at it from a standpoint of not just the leaders, but the congregation itself, it's like the more of the hands, the less of the work, right? Okay, uh, when Larry's out there trying to chop down trees and he's getting rid of all the branches, 
Isn't it easier when a whole lot of people come and grab a branch each and move them as opposed to one guy working all day to get all them branches out of there? Well, the a ministry is no different. You know, can the rabbi do everything? Mm, he can, but you'll wear him out in a hurry, you know? So really, the more of the hands, the less of the work. That's an old Oklahoma saying that really means a lot, okay? Now, when we see the idea of leaders, all you're looking at are people who accept responsibility, okay? When I say leaders like Rabbi or uh, Rabbi Isaac or uh, Dr. Joel, when he gets up here to teach, Bob does a lot, uh, Jeff, these are all leaders in our, oh, Rabison, no, can't forget you, uh, and your wife. A lot of work done by these people, okay? All I do is I get up here and play guitar, that's it. So I don't need, you know, it's easy for me. But when we see all this work being done, right, okay, these are people who stepped up to the plate and said, I'm going to take on some responsibility and don't think, even if there was an empty building here, that there wouldn't be some amount of responsibility to take care of the building even. But when you have human beings to take care of, that responsibility not only gets heavier, but you have God to answer for for how you handled it. Right? Okay? So here's how it becomes easier. Okay? Um, I read different translations of these scriptures that I was looking at. Okay, and this is going to lead us segue right into what, what will be what makes everything easier. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So, leading with a servant's heart by what? Who said it? Say it loud. Example. Okay, do as I say, not as I do doesn't work. Doesn't work in the household, doesn't work in ministry, doesn't work in business, and it certainly doesn't work in politicians. Okay? And I think we're seeing a lot of that right now, aren't we? Folks, leading by example, you don't have to say anything to anybody. Your example speaks volumes to them. So we remember our leaders. Especially, and I'm going to say this to everybody in this congregation, you can lead in one particular area for and on behalf of your leaders in this congregation. And what would that possibly be? This is a pop quiz. Come on, you guys know what it'd be. Prayer, folks. Do you pray for your leaders in this congregation? I hope so. Keep them in mind. Let God remind you. Let the Spirit remind you. Bring somebody's face in front of you in your mind and say, oh, I need to pray for that person right now. Just take two seconds out and say, I need to say, there might be something going on right then, like Rabbi's sitting at a red light. Pray for him right then, okay? <laughs> you understand? All right, now, go on to the next one. Okay. Okay, now here's, here's where we're, we're walking into something. That this is like key. Okay, and what, this was segueing into it. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as ones who must give an account. What did I just talk about? About, you know, the father, the head of the household giving an account. The leaders in the congregation have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Okay. It'd be nice if in every congregation, nobody gave any of their leadership any trouble <laughs> okay, so that they could do it with joy without any growing, <laughs> right? Okay, for that would be of, next. I don't know where that went. Okay, I guess that's not what I, sorry about that. It just cut off there. I'm not sure why. But. All right, that word submit, okay, that is the important thing I want you to, to get out of this. Okay, there is uh, another word used in another translation called subjection. Okay? Dictators subject their subjects to their rules and force them upon them. Okay? In the martial arts, one of the martial arts that I have to know is called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and they have what's called submission. People tap out. 
when you, you know, basically bend somebody's elbow to the point where there's too much pain, they'll tap out and they say, you won. Okay? That's the worldview of submission. Now, let me give you the biblical view of submission. What the Bible actually means when it uses that word submit. And I need you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say. It's probably one of them Oklahomaisms I'm about to give you. Submission is doing what somebody else wanted you to do in the first place because you already wanted to do it. Does that make sense? When my rabbi comes up to me and says, Mitch, I need you to teach next week. So sure. I'd do that for you. That's biblical submission. Husbands submitting to their wives and children. Wives submitting to their children and husband. Children submitting to their parents and to other people. And us submitting one to another. Submission is a willingness to do what somebody needed done ahead of time. Okay? And it's a mindset. It is. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of living. It's a way of being. And I tell you that it makes a difference in how employers see you. It makes a difference in how the lost come into the kingdom. It makes a difference in how you can get along with people in your own congregation. That's easy, right? We all get along. Okay. All right. What gives you that to begin with? The submission. How do you wind up with a submissive mindset? A servant's heart. The heart of a servant will have a submissive spirit. Biblical submission, not worldly submission. There's no grudgingly doing something when somebody needs something done in this type of sense. Okay? And it's usually Mishpaka helping Mishpaka. Right? Okay? Now, we're on 13.7. Okay. 13.17, we're there. Okay. All right, this is going to be a little bit long. Go to Ephesians 5. When we get down to verses 15 and a little bit beyond, that's where it's really going to come in. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Go on. And walk in love as the Messiah also loved and gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Go ahead. With sexual immorality and any impurity or greed, don't even let that be mentioned among you as, pro- as proper of the Kedoshim. Go ahead. Obscene course and stupid talk are also out of place, so I guess I can't do anything what I do as a comedian. I shouldn't be talking. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Go ahead. Know for certain that no immoral, indecent, or greedy person who is really an idol worshiper at heart. Okay, stop right there. An idol worshiper at heart. What I say the word idol means? It means nothingness. Okay. And when people worship an idol, they're actually worshiping themselves. So idol worshiper at heart means they're worshiping themselves, doing indecent and greedy things because they want something for themselves, because they worship self, which is worshiping an idol, which is worshiping nothing. Right? So who is really an idol worshiper at heart has no inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and God. Move on. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's judgment comes on the children of disobedience. Move on. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Keep going. For once you were darkness, but now in union with the Lord you are light. Walk as children of light. Keep going. For the fruit of the light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That was not. That must be a TLV. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Keep going. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things that are done by them in secret. Yet everything exposed by the light is being made visible. We're seeing that these days, aren't we? For everything made visible is light. This is why it says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Messiah will shine upon you. So pay close attention to how you walk. 
Not as unwise people, but as wise. Okay, stop there just a second. Because what it's about to say in chapter 16, in verse 16, is where we're at right now. Let's read that one again. So pay close attention to how you walk. The main reason is because you're being watched. Even if it's Big Brother, they're still watching you. Show, give them a reason to throw you in jail. Okay? Not as unwise people, but as wise. Next, this is why. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. Let me read a different version. Redeeming the times because the days are evil. Look at where we're at. Now let me ask you something. Do you think we can be a heavy influence on the world right now? As much darkness is out there, I think we can. We can shine before them. Because everyone in the kingdom is a leader and shines brightly as a light. Moving on. Uh, 17, is that where we're at? For this reason, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk for wine, and re- re- for that is requisite. Instead, be filled with the rock. Stop there. Go back. That is the vital part. Filled with the Ruach. I'm going to say this again at the end. I'm going to say it now. I wasn't even going to mention this until later. There's another scripture that's vital. And if you're going to be a leader in the kingdom, you don't want to walk into a congregation that is not led by the Spirit. I've been there. I've seen it. You can feel it when you walk through the door. It's, it's just, it just hurts you. Okay, those who live by the Spirit, this is what the Scripture says, those who live by the Spirit must be led by the Spirit. Okay, um, when Rabbi Isaac and I get up here with these musicians, he and I, you'll see us communicating a lot, is because there's somebody we're listening to at the same time. Both of us are listening to one entity, the Ruach. There'll be times when we'll look at each other and we just know God wants to go here, and I'll say, yeah, it's like we know. Because I do not, I have been on stage where it was performance. Okay, All through Oklahoma, there's a lot of that. But I have also been in many places, and I pretty much will not do it anymore unless I can get somebody, get on a, on a stage with people who are led by the Spirit also. Because it's, there's no point. There really isn't. It's just a performance after that. I could go out and make money in a bar doing that, you know. Believe me, I could pick up a guitar and go play any day down at any bar and make money. But when I'm here, I'm looking to see the Spirit of God leading all of us, right, into a place that I don't want anybody walking in here to be the same by the time they go out. If you're the same when you walk out of here, I failed you. I don't want to fail you. The information God has given me has been given me by the Spirit. If I do not impart that, led by the Spirit, then I have failed you when you leave here today if you haven't been changed somewhere. It might be tiny, but if you got changed, then God succeeded, not me. Who cares? God could anoint this to talk. He doesn't need me. Okay? All right. Next. Speaking one another. Oh, is that where I was at? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making music in your heart to the Lord. When you guys are worshiping, where's it coming from? It comes from your heart. What kind of heart? Servant's heart. Right. Always giving thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. That other thing there is a side note under the TLV, just so you know. Okay, next. Also, here we go. Comes back to it again. Also, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Messiah. So we have motivation and reason why we do this submission thing, right? Because we serve the Messiah. We serve the King. Okay? Now, he has reason for us to live that way because he knows the benefit. Right? Right? If the only motivation you have is just to do it for reverence to the Messiah, that's fine. But you know what? 
If Bob comes up to me tomorrow and says, Mitch, I really need you to just go clean the toilets. Nobody's been over here to be able to do it. Could you take care of it for me? I have had musicians who said, we don't do that. We're musicians. I'd say, where's the toilet brush? You need it done? I'll go do it. I still remember um, I used to be a, a Krav Maga instructor in Cape Coral at, uh, under, uh, he's dead now, but a guy named Rabbi Stephen Berkowitz. He was a 10th degree in several different arts. And he was a Goju-Ru instructor. And the, uh, you know, you ever seen the Karate Kid? That's Goju-Ru Karate. And, uh, you know, I studied under that. Peter Urban brought Goju-Ru over from um, Okinawa. And he was the biggest name there is. I mean, they made that movie because of what Peter Urban brought to America. Okay? Still, that's where I got that from. Peter Urban said that. He says, I don't care. I'll have people clean the floors and everything to pay for, the, for their t- teaching them karate because somebody's got a clean toilet. It's like, yeah. it's like, you know. But the point is, is that a servant's heart, be submissive, and it's like, yeah, I'll take care of that because I know you need it, and I would have done it anyway because I got submission. Right? Go ahead. Why submit to your own husbands as to the Lord? I'm not going to get into that. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Messiah is also the head of his community, himself the Savior of everybody. See, every once in a while I tell my wife, I'm putting my foot down if you let me. Okay, all right, next. (laughs) She's here today, so if anybody sees her, don't tell her I said that. Okay, but as Messiah's community is submitted to the Messiah... So also the wives to their husbands and everything. Not going to go there. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loved his community and gave himself up for it. Okay, to make her holy, having cleansed her by a mission in the word. Okay, I'm going to stop from what I just said and say that I'm not trying to put men above women. We're all equal, to tell you the truth. But God does put more responsibility on what and more accountability on the men. And we have so many men in this country that won't step up the plate and kind of getting bad because a lot of men want to be women out there these days and all the women want to be men and everything. And really, it is a matter of order. Okay? There is an order, a proper order, but there's also the accountability and the responsibility that is going to come at the end of days, the end of our days. Now, someday I'll stand before the Lord, and I'm going to, he's going to judge me. And I ain't got a problem with that. He's my king. I would want nobody else judging me but him. When he does, he's going to look and say, you screwed this up. It's like, oh, sorry. You know? And then he's going to say, you did good over here, but you kind of screwed this up too. It's like, I'm Sorry. You know, but, you know, thankfully, I have Messiah. If I didn't have Messiah, I wouldn't be the kind of person I am now. I would scared to be thinking what kind of person I would be if I didn't get saved a while back. Because I'm a, one of those type of guys who's kind of like a personality. So, But Messiah is our example to the men. I'm going to tell you that I'm just going to speak out to the men in this congregation. Each one of us had to become more Messiah-like. I'm going to leave that alone, leave that with you. That's in your heart. All of us have to become more like Messiah. You have to look to him to be your barometer of your leadership skills. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone from there. Messiah did this so he might present to himself his glorious community, not having stain or wrinkle or any such thing, but in order that she might be holy and blameless. Moving. In the same way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's an interesting thought, to tell you the truth. Okay, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Messiah also does his community. Keep going. Because we are members of his body. Stop there. Okay, that's why I'm throwing more responsibility on us men, including myself, especially myself. Because to love our, this, I'll tell you, I love my wife. I'll tell you. Today is our 22nd wedding anniversary. 
And I'm selfish about it. I love her because I love myself. I don't want to live without her. Okay? And the scripture tells the men, you need to be selfish about yourself and love your wife. If you love yourself, you'll love your wife. Okay? The thing that scares me the most is the way I see people treating each other out in this world and they have to stand before God. Um, not just husbands and wives, but the way some people, I, I have to deal with children that are being abused and things like that. And I'm looking at the parents going, how are you going to stand before God someday? It's going to be scary. And this is why we're all members of one body. That's why we submit one to another. For this reason, a man shall leave. Uh, I'm not going to go any further on that. Okay. Actually, I'm not going to go there where I want to go. Go ahead and move over to, for, uh, are we at First Timothy yet? Can we go over to First Timothy? Should be First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. If you don't have it, I've got it up here. I gave you that list. Okay. I want you to just listen at the moment, okay? I'll go ahead and read it out of the TLV. Because this is important. I don't, it's not going to help any. Okay, 1 Timothy. Okay, I didn't mark it, so I must not have gave it to her. That's my fault, Joan. 1 Timothy 3 through 8 through 13. Now listen, this is, they use the word in the translation I have that I copied and pasted, which is the only one I could get to real quick. It says, use the word deacons. I don't want you to think of the word deacon. Use the word shamish, servant, okay? Um, you look at the shamish candle, it serves the other candles, Anybody who's a shamus serves others, okay? But what we're talking about in this particular scripture is the ones who take on more responsibilities, such as we've had Jeff, Bob, uh, rabbis, myself, uh, some other people in here. Hope I'm not missing anybody. This is important because there are qualifications for being able to handle, especially in the, in the mishpacha, in the, in the congregation, okay? It says... Just forget that I'm using the word deacons. Just think shamishes. Deacons in like manner must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy to filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in pure consciousness. Now, there's a whole trail I could go on about the mystery of the faith and having a pure conscience with it, but I'm not going to go there. Let these also first be proved, then let them serve as deacons if they be blameless. Women in like manner must be grave, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. And let the deacons be husbands of one wife. Add after that to at a time. Okay, if you've been divorced, that doesn't mean you can't be a servant. Okay, that means back in the day, these people had more than one wife. So one wife at a time. And I could imagine having more than one. <laughs> Ruling their children in their own house as well. For they have served well as deacons to gain to themselves a good standing and great, and here's the, the main thing, great boldness in the faith, which is in the Messiah. Okay? When you serve in a responsibility, in a role of responsibility like this, you will gain more strength in your faith. You might get tested. You might come through some testing and things like that because most people who are going to serve God are going to hit the front lines. But, when you decide to step up to the plate, so to speak, one of the end results that's going to be is that your faith will become bold. Okay? Right now, if somebody was to look me in the eye and say, well, I don't believe in your God. I say, I don't care. I do. Tough. And the Bible calls you a fool. I wouldn't be nice about it. I'm not really that nice a guy sometimes. But usually that opens up for me a path that becomes very nice. Okay, uh, especially when you're dealing with bikers. I have witnessed bikers. And it's like you know, they after they threaten me, I said, yeah, whatever. You know. Now, moving on. Uh, seeing I screwed up and didn't give you that. Sorry about that. Can you go to Titus second chapter? 
Got that one? Yeah, that was my fault, sorry. Okay, all right. Now, this is the entire second chapter. Okay, I hope I'm not going too long. There's a clock there. I have no idea what it says. But speak thou the things, or actually, let me, but as for you, speak things that are fitting for sound instruction. Okay, now he's talking to Titus on this. Keep going. Older men are to be clear-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. Stop. Some of us qualify as older men. And we're supposed to be clear-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, and in love, and in patience. What does that sound like? It sounds like a servant's heart again, doesn't it? Moving on. Go ahead. Likewise, older women are to be sanctified in demeanor, not backbiting or enslaved to much wine, and let them be teachers of what is good. Not going to talk about that. Keep going. So that they may train the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Keep going. To be self-controlled, pure imagining their household, kind, submitted to their own husbands, so that God's word may not be dishonored. So now the only thing I'm going to speak to the women is this. You don't want to do anything that dishonors the word of God. Take that as you will. Take it to heart. It's a word. Okay. Moving on. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, and that's not easy. You know, there are some people that we're talking to, and even in this congregation, it's like, dude, please do not do that. Okay, Go ahead. In all things, showing yourself to be an example of good deeds. There you go, example again. Integrity of instruction, dignity, keep going. Sound speech beyond criticism, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. We don't want to give the enemy any ammunition, do we? Urge servants, I hate the word slaves, to submit themselves to their own masters. Here we go again, well-pleasing and not back-talking. Yeah, we've got a bit of that, don't we? At least where I'm work, I've, got, I've seen it. Not stealing, but showing all good faithfulness so that they may do credit to their teaching about God, our Savior, and everything. Keep going. But the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Keep going. Training us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live in a manner that is self-controlled and righteous and godly in the present. Keep going. Okay, back up. All right, okay. Living in the present. Okay. Not living in the past. Being aware of the future, but not losing the moment. That's one of the hardest things I have ever, ever been able to teach a lot of people, especially uh, in my martial arts training, that's one of the most important things that I teach the people is to think of the future. Don't worry about what just happened. Be in the present, in the moment. Because, you know, in martial arts training and fighting, and things, the kind of training that I teach, you better be able to move fast because it'll save your life. When you want to take a knife or a gun out of somebody's hand, you better be able to be in the moment, okay, and not hesitate. Same thing with the way we live our, God, our lives. We are in the moment living the servant's life with a servant's heart, forgetting about the past because that's God's, you know, you and God. And don't worry about the future because you can't do anything about it. You only plan for it, but you know what? You've got to be able to, to be a Marine and adapt and overcome in any moment, right? Okay. Next. We wait for the blessed hope and appearance of the glory of our God and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. Keep going. He gave himself for us so he might redeem us from every lawless deed and so that he might purify himself as a chosen people zealous for good deeds. Keep going. So communicate these things and encourage and correct with complete authority. Let no one look down on you. Keep going. Now, it's just before the Feast of Fast over. Oh, we're in John. Okay, never mind. Okay. Now, in the translation that I have, I want to pull out one little thing. It says that the word of God be not blasphemed. Okay. And that's the thing about it. When you live a servant's life of a servant heart, you will affect people by your actions. 
Okay. Like I said, we never want to give the enemy ammunition. When they see you being submissive to another believer, when they see you not backbiting, when they see you not griping when you're told to do something you may not say like to do at your job, that, that gets noticed probably quicker than anything else. It really does. I mean, you would think that the, the minute you do something wrong, that the hammer's ready to fall. Everybody's looking at you saying, oh, my God, look what he did. And, yes, they will come at you if you did anything out of line at all. I had that happen recently. I got reprimanded for uh, how I handled a student and what I said to him. And it wasn't inappropriate, but it could. It, but, you know, I mean, you, we all make mistakes. But the thing about it is, is that everything you do that's good gets seen, not talked about. Does that make sense? Okay. So how aware do we have to be of having this servant's heart and how we walk and how we do our things? Okay. Very aware. Because you are being watched. And it's not just Google. Because I know everywhere I go, I go to Home Depot, my phone comes up, how was, how was Home Depot? It's like, you people need to stop stalking me. But the world does notice you. The good you do, but they won't say anything to pat you on the back. And I want a ton of evidence against me when they decide to throw us in prison for being of the faith. That's fine with me. I want to have the evidence. Now, I'm going to quickly, I'm not even going to read this. This is John 13, 1 through 17. You guys know what this story is about. It's when Messiah, I'm only going to read one little piece to make it understood. He took his uh, garments off, put on a slave's garments, and washed the feet of his disciples. He showed what a servant's heart and a servant's actions were like because he led by example. And then, I'm not going to read it out of here. I'll just, okay, let me, let me just read it here. So when he washed their feet in his garments and he sat down, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should all wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you can also do as I have done for you. I say unto you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither one that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, blessed you are if you do them. You could hear it all day long. You could get a good message. You could write down notes. But if this doesn't sink in here and come out here in action doesn't do you any good. Now, quickly, I'm going to run through the rest of it. Okay, there's no more scriptures on this. Uh, back when I was in a Christian rock band, we did a song by Cavens called, called Lead of Love. And I really love that song, and I like the title because that is how we lead. It's by love. There is no leading that works correctly that isn't led by love and compassion. Okay? Now, I'm going to read this from a website because I've known this type of leadership for a very long time based out of business, not out of ministry. And uh, when I saw it in ministry and saw people promoting it in ministry, it's like, oh, well, now I know where they got it now. Okay, defining a servant leader. This is a, a website that teaches leaders how to be servant leaders. Okay. Servant leadership is a philosophy and set of practices that enriches the lives of individuals, builds better organizations, and ultimately creates a more just and caring world. According to the Center of Servant Leadership, if that evokes your ideal of socially responsible organizations. Okay, so it's the Center for Servant Leadership that came up with this many, many years ago. Servant leadership is a classic concept, but the term was coined in 1970 when Robert K. Greenleaf published his essay, The Servant as a Leader. 
Greenleaf maintained the servant leader is a servant first. Greenleaf believed that organizations, not just individuals, could also be servant leaders. His second major essay, The Institution as a Servant, notice that? That's pretty cool. Unequivocally reinforced that point. So, not only are we individual servants, but as a congregation, we're servants. An organization can be a servant. We had uh, the sheriff's department, right? That was going out. They were being as an organization. They were being a servant. Okay, this isn't. It's a biblical concept, but you know the world has actually taken this on back in the seventies. Unlike authoritarian leaders, the servant leader does not depend on act, accumulating or exercising power within an organization. Instead, the servant leader first considers the needs of others first. Second, commits to helping anyone to develop expertise and expertise and improve performance. And third, insists that the organization make a positive contribution to society. There are three types of leadership styles. And the servant leadership is the one that we want to focus on. But one is authoritarian. This leader accumulates power and uses it to manage and lead the organization. People typically must follow strict rules and procedures with little deviation. A precipitative leader, this leader empowers people to be creative, offers suggestions and opinions, and encourages subordinates to provide input on senior management decisions. And then laissez Fair is a loosely translated by the French. It means let them do as they will. And it's basically let them do what they want. That doesn't work either. Servant leadership most clo closely resembles precipitative leadership. While history often cites few examples of any management theories beyond the authoritarian leadership, it's actually an ancient approach. Lao Tzu referenced servant leadership in his classic Chinese text, Tao Te Ching, as early as 500 BC. This concept isn't new. Okay, it's possibly forgotten, but it's not new. Okay, now I'm going to close with one last little reading. This is from a motivational video that I saw about being a boss versus a leader. Now, it's from a business standpoint. Okay, but what I want to just I just want to catch some of the things they say so that you understand. It's the boss versus the leader, uh, leader, okay? A boss says I, a leader says we. Bosses are blinded by pride while leaders can really see. It, it's a rhyme. A leader always asks bosses they command. A boss points fingers, but a leader extends a hand. A boss says go. A leader says let's go. Leaders consider ideas. Bosses say heck no. Bosses put you down. Leaders lift you up. Because leaders give love while bosses don't give a diddly. That was some, I had to change a word there. <laughs> bosses use people, abuse people, and leaders groom people. Okay? They look for what's good inside and improve people. Leaders have mastered the art of inspiration while bosses have mastered the art of manipulation. A boss yells and screams like they're on a TV show and a leader treats the janitor like he's the CEO. They are compassionate and know the community comes first. Bosses think culture is something only found in yogurt. Ask yourself this question. Have you ever heard of a world boss? Or is it a world leader? Is it a religious boss or a religious leader? Community boss? Community leader. And a business boss? Or is it considered business leader? Okay. So basically, leadership done properly is done as a servant, period. Leadership not done properly is done as a dictator. Now, if there's one thing I want you to really understand is there is only leaders in this room. I don't care what age you are. There are only leaders in this room. As long as you're a part of the kingdom, you're a leader. Right? When we go through the Messiah's example, 
be able to serve others. And you know what? The more you focus on somebody else as opposed to focusing on yourself, the more joy you find. And the more you serve, the more joy you find. It's true. So, Shabbat Shalom, everybody.